Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to our 15th annual Environmental Awareness Day. The topic is green infrastructure, which has been a theme of Vobec this last year. And this topic seems even more relevant than it did a year ago. Now, as most of you know, this event was postponed. We were supposed to have it last Sunday, but it was postponed due to Tropical Storm Henri, which is kind of ironic as the topic is about how to deal with, among other things, stormwater. And of course, we had a lot of stormwater. Now, the New York Times article about 10 days ago talked about how the Western US is parched, which is causing drought and wildfires, and the Eastern US is drenched, causing flooding and erosion. And in today's New York Times is an article about how the Colorado River is drying up, which is going to affect 40 million people. So as we reckon with climate change going forward, water and how we manage it is going to play an increasingly important role in our lives. So we're very excited to have our guest speaker, Frank Piccinini, to talk about green infrastructure. First, I wanna talk about a few housekeeping issues. First of all, we muted everybody upon entrance and that's to avoid any sort of background noise. There will be a Q&A session at the end and you can unmute yourself at that point if you would like to. And also the session is being recorded and we're gonna be posting it to our website and you can find it at bobeck.org. And that's if you want to forward this talk to anybody who wasn't able to attend. Now there are relevant icons for today and on your computer somewhere, depending on what computer, what kind of computer or device you're using, you're going to find these icons. And the ones I wanna point out to you are the chat and the reactions. So if you click on the chat, you're going to pull up a chat box. And in there, you can enter any sort of questions you have as we go along. And I have a question in chat now, just for fun, if you can enter where you're calling from. I know that last week we had two or three people who were calling in from the West Coast. I don't know if that's still the case. Uh, our attendee roster has sort of changed dramatically with the event being postponed, but it's kind of fun to see where people are calling from. Also, you'll see the reactions icon. And if you click on that, you can see a raised hand and you can use that if you have a question. Now I want to talk about who we are, what Vobec is, and you can see it's the Village of Ocean Beach Environmental Commission. We are a mayoral appointed commission and our job is to advise the mayor on environmental issues. We have seven members. I am Camille Giuliano, and along with David Lieber, we're the co-host of Vobec. David is working on our annual beach cleanup. He's also working on, um, working on creating a household, household hazardous waste day for Ocean Beach. And we're looking toward next um, spring to host that event. We also have Beth Jakobowitz, she is our secretary and she's also the liaison with OBA, the Ocean Beach Association. She also uh, handles the newsletter. She sends out a newsletter every couple of months. It goes out to our mailing list. Then we have David Lipsky, who is, he works for the DEP and he has an awesome knowledge of regulations. It's kind of stunning uh, how much he knows about regulations. It's been very helpful to us over the years. And uh, he and David Lieber are working on reinstituting dune day so that we can plant dune grass on our dunes all along Ocean Beach. We're very excited about that. Lisa Lowe is our liaison with the town of Islip and that has to do with recycling and hazardous household hazardous waste. Judy Steinman is our liaison with the village office. And Emily Wicks, if I could hand out titles, she would be our communications director. She is in charge of the Ocean Beach Bulletin Board there on Facebook. We have a bulletin that goes up every two weeks. She's responsible for helping us come up with ideas and with meeting the deadlines. Now, I'm not gonna go into all of our projects, but suffice it to know that we all work very hard all year long to keep Ocean Beach 
as green as feasible, given our various constraints that we're dealing with. I also want to mention that we have free tote bags for attendees. And I want to mention that these tote bags are made from recycled plastic. And as such, it fills a need for using all the plastic that is collected nationwide. In order to make the system complete, you can collect it, but you also need to recycle it. And so having these bags from recycled plastic is a great way to sort of close that loop. So if you'd like a free tote, you can stop by the village office this week to pick up one. And Frank, we can mail you one if you would like as our guest speaker. And lastly, I wanna say thanks to the Ocean Beach Community Fund for their continued financial support. And lastly, I want to introduce our guest speaker. Frank Piccinini is the Director of Habitat Restoration at Save the Great South Bay. He's also one of the founding members. And if you all recall about four years ago, we had Marshall Brown come and talk also from Save the Great South Bay. And he talked about the nitrogen levels in the Great South Bay. So we're very excited to have uh, Frank here today. He is a biologist as well as an environmental attorney, uh, which I think are complementary strengths that are very necessary in this day and age. We okay. will have a Q&A at the end. You can either enter the questions in chat or we can unmute you if you prefer. Okay. so. Thank you all again so much for attending, and I'm going to hand it now over to Frank. Thank you very much, Camille. So I'll just, you have to, uh, oh. yep. I am now the host. Okay. Okay, so you, you all see my presentation here? Yes, we do. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunities to speak with you folks. And it's so nice to see other organizations that, you know, sister organizations to Save the Great South Bay really taking things into their own hands. Uh, I, I've been, I spent a lot of time in Fire Island. It's beautiful over there. You know, I, I see all the, the dune grass and patches of milkweed and native plants and stuff over there. So it really makes me smile. And I know that somebody's looking uh, at Fire Island's ecological health. It's great. So, uh, my name is Frank Piccinini, uh, as, as Camille had mentioned. I, I'm the president of Spadefoot Design and Construction. We, we're a full service design build ecological restoration company um, focusing on uh, stormwater management, ecological restoration, you know, native plants and invasive species removal. Uh, also co-founder and partner at Simple Consulting. It's more of a, uh, a B2B sort of consulting firm we work with not-for-profit groups and in real estate developers and environmental groups. So, uh, but here I'm, I'm in my capacity as chair of Habitat, um, chair of the Habitat Restoration Committee at Save the Great South Bay. Um, and so Marshall, uh, I, he's a very engaging speaker, uh, no doubt. And I'm sure that he spoke about the fact that we do have nitrogen issues in the Bay uh, and, and, it's, and it's problematic. And there are a lot of uh, remedial techniques taking place in the Bay, you know, some even kelp has been thrown out there as, as a way to kind of reduce nitrogen levels. But what we found out over the years through our research is that there isn't, there's a eutrophication issue in the Bay, but it's really the mainland that's sick. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's the input of the nitrogen from the mainland that's at issue here. So we started the Bay Friendly Arts Program as a way to really uh, help people take things into their own hands, uh, to start where you stand, so to speak. Um, so there's three essential elements to bay-friendly yards, and I'll go through them here, but it's uh, native plantings, it's an ecological restoration, stormwater management, uh, and, and proactive stewardship. Okay. So I'd like to always take our, take folks on a little bit of a, a you know, rewind just to kind of figure out why we are uh, where we are today in terms of some of these, these nitrogen issues in the bay and some, some of the uh, degradation, unfortunately, that is afflicting our, our nature. So prior to 1900, Long Island was largely a, a series, uh, largely untouched. Um, it was dotted with farms. You know, believe it or not, uh, the Pine Barrens extended way into Nassau County, not way into Nassau County, but 
as far as uh, past the you know the Nassau border, so went way out there. There was a large grasslands in in Sayville and Hempstead, uh, the Sayville grasslands and the Hempstead plains uh, that are unfortunately just a fraction of their their contiguous range. They, there used to be a a chain of uh, Atlantic white cedar forests, swamp forests, an almost contiguous chain from all the way from Montauk to Brooklyn, and. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. We drained the wetlands, we uh, timbered all of the Atlantic white cedar, uh, and you know we we started housing developments. And you know, so it was it was a very beautiful land. It still is beautiful, but it's not without some cha environmental challenges here. So, how did it start? Really, it's Levittown was is really the epicenter of this sort of suburban way of life as we know it. Uh, mass produced homes. It's, you know, everybody, it's a postage stamp lot. Everybody has a, a bright green fluorescent lawn as a status symbol, one token, usually non native tree, and a cesspool. Uh, and it was really important to give people this sense of home ownership, you know, the GIs coming back from the war, but it was really this canned productive uh, production of housing uh, that was that was really just unplanned. And then we sort of went out from there. Right, so d we're not demonizing development. Uh, they, in fact, as I had mentioned, I work with a lot of progressive real estate developers to ensure that they develop in a more sustainable and conscientious manner. The issue really though, is that the development of Long Island was largely unplanned. You have to drive everywhere on Long Island. You, you can't, you know, the, there is mass transit, but the housing isn't connected to the mass transit. You have all these strip malls that uh, are really not used anymore or underutilized given the, the advent of online shopping, as well as unfortunately COVID has really decimated retail operations. But you have all these developments and little, as we were growing and sprawling, little consideration was given to environmental impact, including things like, uh, unfortunately, contamination emanating from uh, industrial facilities. But even putting that aside, just the wholesale destruction of ecosystems has really gotten us in a little bit of trouble. Thousands of acres of natural habitat replaced with just turf grass, which is ecologically lifeless. Uh, people use fertilizers and pesticides. It says here the suburban dream. I say the suburban nightmare. Uh, we're pumping our our lawns full of these chemicals just to keep uh, uh, fluorescent green lawn. It's just wasted, just wasteful. Lots of invasive and ornamental species. The invasives are are running running amok, even in very uh, intact forest areas. Um, and as mentioned at the top of this is uh, abundant nitrogen pollution associated with stormwater runoff and also with uh, leaking uh, septic systems and fertilizer input. Um, and unfortunately, it really bugs us that uh, because we're not, we, we have these artificial moonscapes filled with uh, non-native plants and with uh, just turf grass, you know, we're losing the, the very basic trophic level that uh, that entirety of life depends on uh, bugs, right? So uh, when you remove that level of, of invertebrates, all the things that uh, that are required for to, you know, that eat them, the things that eat them, the things that they pollinate, really everything that uh, our, our life needs is kind of the fundamental aspect of it is bugs. And, and we destroy the vast majority of their homes uh, and we can't live without them. So that's the uh, the doom and gloom, and just to kind of set the context. But the great news is, is that we really can help uh, a little bit on on your land uh, in the aggregate. You know, if we all do a little, it add up to a whole lot, and that's the the whole idea behind the Bay Friendly Arts program. Um, so we'll go through these elements of the Bay Friendly Arts, but there's habitat restoration, stormwater management, and local stewardship. Starting with habitat restoration, why is it important? Well, as I mentioned, that you know our entire way of life is dependent on the insects, and uh, one of the reasons why we want to do some habitat restoration is to support local pollinators. Um, you know, things like caterpillars and, and native bees and, and so on. This is the fundamental trophic level, the connection between plants and higher levels of life. Without it, we don't have any. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any life, uh, and. We want to do some habitat restoration because these native plants are adapted to the local ecosystems. Uh, deeper roots, uh, so so basically, uh, it, it really will help maintain and enhance the land that it's on. So I, I've given you this whole doom and gloom about 
uh, all the compaction associated with turf grass and uh, these invasive species, uh, nature has an incredible ecological memory. If you just foster life on your land, uh, not only will it, um, you know, you just remove the turf grass and continue to edit out the invasives, uh, there's an amazing seed bank under everybody's lawn, uh, out in, uh, even at, in Fire Island and everywhere. Uh, just, just let it grow and it'll come back. And uh, as these native plants begin to grow older, uh, it will enhance the health of the land. Uh, that it's, you know, so even if you have cruddy soil, over time, the soil will increase in its capacity. Um, so, so there's some easy plant this, not that. Uh, this, this is a, this is a fun one, and it, unfortunately, the the plants on the on the right are planted a lot. So, burning bush, uh, deer don't like it. Uh, it turns, admittedly, it turns a, a relatively pretty color in the fall, uh, but for the rest of the season, it's a nondescript sort of ugly greenish bush. And it just goes and goes. What happens is the birds will eat the berries, uh, fly off into the woods, poop, and you have a new burning bush in the middle of the woods. And this stuff really crowds out the understory of our local you know, local forests. And we're very hard at work ripping a lot of this stuff out. But for goodness sakes, don't plant any more of it. Instead, switch to a red chokeberry. Um, those will do really well in a place like Fire Island. And they have similar beautiful... Uh, red foliage in the in the in the fall, and the birds love the berries. So, as opposed to this fountain grass, uh, this this has become a really big problem. It's it's really invading everywhere. Uh, switch instead to you know big blue stem or little blue stem. Uh, there's there's a lot of native grasses that you can choose instead. You know dogwoods instead of pears. Uh, you know, these the pears drive me nuts. Uh, unfortunately, they're everywhere in our woodlands, and they've been handed out for for years by municipalities. I don't quite get it. Uh, plant milkweeds instead of foxgloves. Uh, again, it's equally beautiful, and milkweeds are uh, you know uh, this is butterfly weed. Milkweeds are the host plant for monarch butterflies. So not only are they beautiful, and in my opinion, more beautiful because I understand their function. But there, you'll you'll have blooms in the form of beautiful butterflies, kind of hosting and, and nectaring on these plants, laying their eggs, and you see these crazy bright colored, excuse me, caterpillars. All right, so uh, so that's you know, plant this, not that, but also uh, one. I think one of the biggest things that you can do to enhance the ecological value of your land is just to remove the invasives, addition by subtraction. On the left, you see uh, this sort of ubiquitous English ivy. Uh, the stuff is everywhere. You drive up and down, uh, or I'm sorry, you drive east and west on the Southern State or the LIE, you look to the right and left, and you can just see all the trees are just being absolutely strangled by this stuff. It's terrible. It does spread. Uh, I've heard a lot of folks say, oh, my English ivy stays put. Uh, once it goes vertical, it produces berries. The birds eat it. It's a similar story and, you know, fly off. Uh, picture on the right is uh, oriental bittersweet. It's another pernicious uh, invasive plant. And it's actually choking out this oak here. Those are almost ligature marks on this oak. Now we freed this oak and you, know, you can almost hear it breathe a sigh of relief because uh, you know it's, a, it's got a new lease on life. But you can see how terrible these invasive plants are for the, for the health of our native species. Uh, and then ornamental plants. Uh, I have less of a problem with ornamental plants than I do with invasive plants. Uh, things like hostas generally and hydrangeas, uh, they, they generally don't spread out, you know, and escape cultivation, uh, but they, they're they lifeless. They, I, we have here, they might as well be statues. And, and that's true. Uh, they, they don't attract any diversity of life. Um, they're, they're just sort of decorations. Why not decorate with something that uh, you know is equally stunning and native, and will bring with it the life that we we so are uh, you know losing, unfortunately, uh, here on Long Island. Yeah, and then uh, you know what to plant. Well, well, first of all, I you know I should give a little bit of a um, sort of a, a Fire Island special here. We have a lot of deer issue, of course, over there. Uh, and it's and it's often sandy and dry. It's just the nature of it. So things like bayberries, um, cedars will do really well. Um, you could plant oaks. There's a lot of oaks that'll do well. You have to kind of do some a little bit of deer protection for the oaks. Uh, so really, it's just you can fence in your whole yard, or 
as you plant the trees, just sort of uh, put wire cages around them. Once they're above six feet in height, they, you can kind of graduate them out of, of the need for the cage. Uh, but you know, you can go to, uh, I mean, email us at yards at save the great south bay.org or if you want to kind of do some research on your own, the National Wildlife Federation has a, a native plant finder. And what's really cool about them is that it shows you how many hosts, how many pollinator species are associated with that particular host plant. Um, and so, if you, you know, it's funny because a lot of people think of pollination, pollinators and, oh, we need milkweed, oh, we need goldenrods, these herbaceous perennial flowering plants. Um, and of course you need that, these, the plants, uh, the butterflies will rely on the nectar, uh, but really if you, if the biggest bang for the buck that you can get in terms of po helping the pollinators is believe it or not planting trees. Uh, oak trees, oaks, for example, support something like 400 species of pollinators, whereas things like goldenrods, which you know is the, one of the higher uh, herbaceous plants will only support about 30 to 35 pollinators, something like that. Don't quote me on the numbers. National Wildlife Federation has some evidence-based research on this, but you know those are the ballparks. So you can see that trees are really the best uh, bang for the buck that you can get. And uh, reduce lawn. Uh, my kiddo, I have a little three-year-old uh, who might you know pop in at any moment now, uh, and and he loves running around on the lawn. So we, we this is our our lot in in Huntington, and uh, he he'll run around. But honestly he loves going to the margins and looking, you know, under stones and looking at the, for the pollinators, I, watching the birds from the window. And actually, if I showed you an updated picture about, you know, up to that chair is now just a big bed, all planted out with more plants. And every year we bite off more and more at the, at the margins. Um, think of, think of your lawn as a, uh, as an area rug, not wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, right? So if the only time you're walking on that patch of lawn is to mow it, it probably doesn't need to be lawn. Uh, and we have here, lawn is the equivalent of cement. And, and that's true, particularly in the winter, um, you know, from, from the range of old growth forest to, to cement, you know, lawn is much closer to the cement in terms of its uh, stormwater function. So a couple of resources, the uh, invasive species, uh, New York IMAP invasives is a really good resource that has a lot of pictures of invasive species. So you can learn to identify them and, and figure out how to best control them. And I mentioned the National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder. Okay, stormwater. And, and, it's, and it's, it is sort of funny that last week we got rained out of a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Everybody, you know, it, it was sort of, a, it was a lot of rain, but also, uh, not a lot of wind, fortunately, and uh, you know, thank goodness. But it's really problematic uh, the stormwater. I know, I know a lot of press, uh, and understandably so, goes to septic systems and and leaking septic systems as the cause of the the demise of the Great South Bay or these brown tide issues in the Great South Bay. And and yes, of course, uh, wastewater infrastructure needs to be upgraded. Um, but what goes unspoken, and maybe because it's not, it's sort of complicated, is the nitrogen that's just literally falling out of the sky. It's a process called deposition. So as it rains, and even during dry days, uh, nitrogen just falls out of the sky in, in its deposition process. And the, the fate of that nitrogen depends entirely upon the surface on which it lands. So if it lands in a forest, it sort of gets tied up in this nitrogen cycle. And for the most part, it stays put, it sticks. Whereas if it lands on your lawn or if it lands on cement, it basically just gets rushed, uh, pushed down into you know, storm drains out to the Great South Bay. Uh, and, and it's a huge, huge contributor. Uh, and it's, all, it's also important too, to keep in mind that the stormwater itself uh, will is, is forcing uh, low nitrogen loads out of septic systems. So in other words, um, it, it's all interconnected, right? So the more stormwater is rushing down the street and kind of oozing into the, into the groundwater, as opposed to staying put on your land, uh, the, more, uh, the more the septic system is sort of getting overrun and more nitrogen is getting forced out of it. So it's, it's, it's the nitrogen deposition and the runoff of that nitrogen, in addition to the fact that the sheer volume of stormwater that runs off kind of forces nitrogen out of the septic systems. So it all goes into the same soup. Unfortunately, it goes out into the Great South Bay and, and causes these algal, algal blooms. 
Um, so here's, uh, so what can you do? What, what kind of stormwater management techniques would we recommend? So there's, there's, there's ranges of opportunities to really work with the land to help retain stormwater on site. Um, here's a bioswale. Uh, we built this one in, in Huntington and the, the homeowner had a very, has a very steep driveway and there was a, uh, a storm drain there. Uh, I'm sorry, a French drain at the bottom. Uh, unfortunately, the French drain got overwhelmed in its capacity, would get clogged up, and then it would back flood into, the, into this homeowner's garage. So they retained us to do this, this bioswale. And, the idea, and you can see the rocks here. That's to dampen the erosive flow of the stormwater. Um, and then we have what's called an infiltration pit. Uh, basically, it sounds complicated. It's really not. We dug a hole and we put some aggregate down and then we backfilled it, left a little bit of base in to promote infiltration uh, or, you know, just seeping of the stormwater. And then we have an overflow pipe. Uh, and the cool thing about using uh, nature as a stormwater manager is that it, it's, one, it's one of the few investments that you can make that actually appreciates over time. So typical stormwater infrastructure, like a French drain, uh, the day that you put it in, it's at its most, uh, it's, the, it's most efficacious the day you put it in. Uh, the, as, as soon as you put it in, it starts to get clogged. It doesn't work nearly as well. In contrast, when you say, for example, line a bioswale with native plants, the root action actually increases something called soil porosity. So basically the sponginess of the soil. Um, there's subsurface flows uh, associated with evapotranspiration. So basically, you could think of the plants as little straws in the ground, kind of sucking the stormwater up, um, lowering the water table. So, you know, it makes the soil spongier. It sucks the stormwater up quite literally through this underground pumping mechanism. And it enhances something called vertical soil accretion. So basically, uh, the, the soil starts to expand over time. Um, so use nature. And and your and your uh, your investment will appreciate over time. Um, here's a here's a bioswale that we built in Sayville, actually, uh, about a, a block away from the Great South Bay. Uh, and we'll just go through the video here. Oh, jump to another screen. Can you see this still? I'll assume yes. I think yes. everybody's on mute. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bill. <laughs> okay. Uh, so <clears throat> to give you an idea of what what's going on at this block. Uh, everybody kind of just puts up a barrier. It's, it's Suffolk County, no curb. So everybody just puts up their own sort of curb. And every time it rains, uh, just water just rushes down the street like a river. And so we created this bioswale. We're actually you know, creating a public good here. Um, we're accepting the stormwater off the street. Uh, and it goes down this vegetated channel. By the way, if you saw an updated picture of this vegetated channel, uh, these the plants are blooming, filled with life, and really the size of you know me. I'm I'm about five five seven, and these plants are huge and beautiful now. Uh, this is just maybe a month or so after construction. After construction, so as you can see, we we channeled the stormwater into our infiltration pit, as we described earlier. So basically, a spot where we uh, where it enhances filtration. And then we line the whole thing with native plants and we make it look designed, by the way. Uh, and, and that's important, right? Because this is, we're, we're doing these things in, in, people's, uh, in people's yards, right? So, um, oh. so I, I, I do see a lot of, um, oh gosh, I, I do see a lot of you know, native plant plantings that, that look a little bit more chaotic, like we just, you know, through stuff here and, and without really thinking about it, it's important that there's a sense of controlled wild to your to your work, so people know that it's purposeful. So we left little strips of grass uh, in front of it just to just so that you know it's clear that this is something that we did on purpose, as opposed to you know we stopped mowing the lawn. Uh, trying to figure out how to get this thing to present again, we'll just go like this. Um, a really simple solution is is rain barrels. Uh, taking water off your your leader and your gutter and just and sort of holding it in place so the idea behind a rain barrel and similar similar applications is that you know the water stays in the barrel and it and it limits what's called the first flush most of the contaminants that come from from a storm that it comes with, with that first rush of water that that goes downstream or down the street you know as it were and 
the rain barrel really holds on to that water and you can use it over time to irrigate some of your garden. So it's, it's a really simple way for you to help at home without having to do, you know, major construction, doing a big bioswell in your yard. If everybody had a rain barrel, my goodness, we'd be in a lot better shape than we're in right now. Um, and rain gardens, uh, this one, uh, oops, gosh, I'm having a lot of trouble. Sorry about that. So a rain garden really, there's no clearly defined terms for what's a rain garden versus a bioswale versus an infiltration pit, but basically a spot for stormwater to come sit uh, that's usually vegetated. Uh, so we we had a, uh, this this homeowner had, had a lot of flooding issues on the cement. It was just ponds back there by those chairs in the back. Uh, and we just kind of went with the, the grade there and, and created this beautiful little garden that collects the stormwater. And then the third element is uh, local stewardship. Uh, it, we say stewardship, it, it's different than maintenance. So maintenance to me implies, you know, using fertilizers and pesticides and, you know, leaf blowers and the like. Really, it's every little patch that you can, you can have counts uh, and, and please ignore the invasive clematis that's in the stock photo that we used here. Uh, but you can see this cute little kid and, and it, that's really why we, you know, personally I do it. I, I wanna leave this place a better, I wanna leave Long Island and really the world a better place for my kiddo. So um, you really should do things like um, eliminating pest, fertilizers and pesticides. We don't use any of that on, on our lawns and it's green. Uh, the kid runs around, it's perfect. Now, of course, there's some diversity in our lawn. Some of it's crabgrass, some of it's not sedge, but it, it's all green and the kid runs around. Why are we poisoning the earth? I don't quite get it. Um, mow less, you know, if you can get, convince your landscaper to come every two weeks, uh, or if you're doing your own lawn, it's an excuse to do it less often. Uh, it's it's sort of this landscaper scam, if you will, that they come every single week. Because what happens is, is that you're basically, you're scalping the, the lawn every single week. It doesn't have, the plant is constantly in the position where it's sending up, you know, more above ground growth. Because, oh no, I need to photosynthesize. And, you know, I just got scalped. So they, they send up the blade of grass. They don't have, the grass blades don't have enough time to really invest in the subsurface infrastructure, the roots. Uh, so what happens is, is that, you know, they, they get scalped every week. The lawn uh, gets sort of brown. Every first drought, everything uh, starts to get all patchy and brown uh, and, and it gets sort of diseased. And then the landscapers say, oh, well, you know, it, it, your lawn looks like crud. Let's let's use some chemicals. We, we need to really fertilize here. Um, so cut less often and leave the clippings. You can use a mulching mower. You can set the blades to higher. It's uh, it, it will really help leave the leaves in the fall. What a great excuse to be lazy, right? Uh, the, these leaves are where next month, next year's pollinators are, are hiding. Beautiful salamanders and awesome wildlife are, are really reliant on these leaves. When, when you have things like um, chickadees that you know, overwinter here, they need the leaf litter in order to forage. So, so just leave it there. And if you want it, if you have an area that you want to keep a little bit more neat I understand having a, a pile of leaves in your front yard is not for everybody. Some homeowner, homeowners associations might complain, your neighbors might complain, so on and so forth. One good tip that you can do is just pull the leaves up, use a mulcher, and just kind of put the leaves into your bed. You'll be helping um, keeping some habitat there. You'll help the whole vertical soil accretion process, and you'll see that the beds will become healthier and more productive over time. <laughs> And watch those invasives. Um, again, I, I just want to really emphasize the fact that you know, if if you do nothing else on your land, if you just rip out all the invasives, uh, you'll be doing such a great service for the environment. So please um, take out the garlic mustards. Take out, you know, and and for goodness sakes, don't do not plant any burning bush, wisteria, all these terrible invasive plants that you can still bizarrely buy at the at the nurseries. Just just skip it. Use something native. Use something beautiful addition by subtraction and start where you stand if we all did a little bit uh, it would add up to a whole lot and i really appreciate the opportunity to come talk about this and i, I imagine that there might be some fire island specific questions in you know in the commentary so i'm happy to i'm happy to take questions 
So people can't, I have, I have a couple of questions before we get started. Now, some people can uh, unmute themselves, maybe raise their hand, uh, uh, open up their video, however you want to handle it. Um, but the, the question, I have a couple of questions. Number one, you said that um, trees will support hundreds of butterflies but flowers will only support 20 or 30. What did you mean by that? What, how are you defining support? Well, well I said pollinators. Um, and so pollinators, you know, okay. more, more so than butterflies, um, you know, things like native bees and so on. Uh, but what I mean by support is that you know, eat, a lot of insects will form a, a very specific relationship between the, the plant and, and you know, it'll be part of a necessary part of their life cycle. So we all know about milkweed is what monarch butterflies need. Things like okay. tiger swallowtail butterflies are, they need plants of the, of the genus or the family rosaceae, so roses, like uh, Virginia rose or so on, and magnolias, right? So each, a lot of insects will, uh, will form a very specific relationship with a plant. And things like oaks, uh, they, they form relationships with, you know, four, 400 different pollinator species. Uh, and oh, so it's okay. not just yeah, and it's and it's the volume. It's the volume too, right? Like so, one think about one giant oak tree versus a um, versus something like a, a butterfly golden... bush. <laughs> yeah, right. A butterfly bush is, by the way, invasive. Oh, uh, good to yeah. know. So, okay, uh, guys. I'm sorry. I also had um, a second question, which is: I have a rain barrel. And with the recent rainstorms that we've had, I can't use the water fast enough. Um, and I also have, uh, it's, it's topped off into various other barrels that I have. I now have probably a hundred gallons of water. My question is, um, I, I can't use it fast enough. And I'm afraid, you know, there's like two week limit for before it starts to uh, encourage mosquito uh, yeah. birth, I guess, hatching. Right. And so is it possible to put mosquito dunks in those? Yeah. Can I still, I know I'm not supposed to feed fruits and vegetables, but for our regular plants, can I put a, a mosquito dunk in and still use that to plant other flower, uh, other water, other flowers? Yeah, yeah, you sure can. I was actually going to okay. suggest that. So you, you beat me to my, uh, my suggestion and uh, and we should tell, uh, for those who don't know, mosquito dunks are uh, commercially available. It's the ones that have BTI as the active ingredient. It's right. a natural bacteria. Uh, and, and one good hack that you and your neighbors should definitely do if you can convince them is get a, a bucket from Home Depot, throw some straw in it, throw mosquito dunkers in it. And what happens is the mosquitoes are wildly attractive, go figure, to the standing water in the bucket. They breed in the bucket. Um, but the larvae never make it out of the bucket. Okay. So yeah, controlling the larvae is really the way to control a mosquito po population. The whole um, poisoning, wholesale poisoning that Suffolk County, sorry, uh, Suffolk County Vector Control pursues, right. in addition to all the private spraying by companies like Mosquito Joe's, it's such a, it's such a scam. It's like trying to keep water off the beach. It's never going to happen. Take care of the mosquitoes as the larvae, and and you'll it'll be much more effective. Interesting. Okay, and one last question: um, You talked about leaf litter and how it was good to keep it in place uh, in the fall, so that different insects can and salamanders, etc. What about removing it in the spring? Does that disrupt wildlife as well? Well, wait until if you're going to do that and you want the the benefits of leaving it, wait until it's like consistently above 50 degrees at okay. night uh, okay. and then you can remove it. Um, but, you know, or you can just mulch it and, and kind of put it aside. But you'll be surprised, by the way, uh, especially some of the more uh, weedy trees like Norway maples, which we unfortunately have a lot of around uh, the leaves like you'll be surprised how many of the leaves are gone by next spring, almost all together. Mm -hmm. You run the mower over at once and they're just, they're just gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you mulch them, you know, you can buy a commercial mulcher for like, you know, $250 uh, and, and it'll be good. And you just, Oh, you we're losing your audio. You, for some reason you were, Oh, you were can okay, you hear me now? Better. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I said, you can buy a commercial mulcher for like $250 or so, um, or, and just, take all your leaf litter, throw them in the mulcher, put the mulch into the beds and you never have to hire the landscapers to come in with mulch every spring. Right, you okay. You have your own mulch. 
Excellent. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Um, okay. If anybody else would like to ask, I see Andy has his hand up. Um, Andy, what is your question? Well, this first of all, thanks to you and to Frank. This is a great, important uh, session. Um, my question is perhaps a little bizarre. Um, with rising, rising groundwater, uh, yeah. including some saltwater intrusion, it seems to me that um, the non-natives are, are really, the invasives are getting to be even more advantaged, which might shift on what natives are able to survive in these more adverse conditions. I don't know whether you have a list of the uh, natives that really can survive in different uh, configurations of water increased, groundwater increase. But, well, um, you know, I, I would kind of take it from a, a slightly different viewpoint. And, and I think you're right, uh, Andy, in, in one sense, but keep in mind that the, the plants that we use in our, our applications are adapted to the region really, right? Mm -hmm. So they're very, uh, they're very good at living here on, you know, our crappy soils uh, that we have and things like a, a, a seaside goldenrod is, you know, is, is not going to really care about your changing groundwater. But what I think that the relationship's a little bit different in that uh, invasive species are proliferating and generally speaking in, invasive species have much less complex rooting systems. Their whole life history, their strategy is to grow up and crowd out, right? And so they don't, like an oak will invest a whole lot of um, energy into its rooting system or a beach, an American beach, whereas a Norway maple that I mentioned, you know, will grow up very quickly and not invest a lot of subsurface uh, infrastructure. So you know, in areas in, in large swaths of, of Long Island, even when we have like more natural areas, quote unquote, it's just all invasive garbage trees, like a giant stands of Norway maples. And because the root systems are so much less complex than our native ecosystems, you have a lot less uh, beneficial like infiltration and, and all these stormwater things I talked about. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the relationship. Um, I, I see but, that there's a question in chat that we both missed. And um, Zabby Hovey from uh, Seaview is asking, she's questioning about um, having the straw in the bucket with the water. What purpose does the bucket serve? Uh, what purpose does the straw serve in that <laughs> scenario you're talking about? It just makes it nasty and stagnant and attracts the mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, hide the bucket under your somewhere where you're not going to, it's not going to be pretty, um, but it's pretty effective. Okay. All right. All right. Excellent. So does anybody else have any questions or I don't see anything in chat and I am looking at all of our, I don't see any hands or anything. I have to tell you that I had a number, of, I have even more questions, mm -hmm. but it seemed like you answered them in your next sentence. So okay. uh, I thought you were very good at, at, um, sort of giving a very complete presentation. Thanks, Camille, I appreciate it. And, sure. I, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Well, we, we really appreciate you taking time out to talk to us. So unless there are any further questions, I'm going to say thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you, Frank. I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to send it to you, Frank. Okay, okay? perfect. All right, terrific. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.